Okay, welcome everyone um, to our second keynote speaker. So for everybody who uh, recognizes my face but is missing the name badges, I'm Liz Alvey from Sheffield. Um, and I'm very excited to hear about um, uh, our student assessment building opportunities for integrity and engagement. Um, and this talk comes from Dr. Thomas Lancaster from Imperial College, who's done lots of really interesting work related to uh, contract cheating and other things our students accidentally and deliberately get up to. <laughs> yes. Maybe not. Okay, so uh, um, welcome to us. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Liz. And I think it's quite fair that what you just said is that academic misconduct can occasionally come about accidentally, but that was not going to be the main focus of this particular session, but welcome everyone. Welcome everyone on Zoom as well. I don't think you can see me, but hopefully you can hear me for this. Yesterday, we had an excellent introductory keynote from Michelle, which was very much focused around numbers and data. I've gone much more along the direction of hoping that I can pass across some ideas about what is happening in the field, give you some things to take back to your own institution and talk about. I'm also very happy if anyone wants to interrupt and argue and ask questions along the way, please feel absolutely free. I'm fairly free form with how I present this type of material. To give you a bit of background about myself with a very badly rendered picture to go alongside it, uh, I'm here under slightly false pretenses compared to the rest of you in that I'm a computer scientist. I'm uh, not a, a bioscientist or whatever the appropriate equivalent term is, although of course we're all in scientific disciplines. There, I'm very much an enthusiast about technology as comes so naturally for both staff and students in the computing field. Officially, my role at Imperial is on the teaching side of things. I'm a teaching fellow. I'm primarily the senior tutor for the master's students in the Department of Computing. So I'm very much focused on student support, and that's why so many of the ideas from Michelle's talk yesterday really resonated with me, and the things I see in my role with my master students also have a similar role as a deputy senior tutor for the undergrads. So very much appreciate all the challenges, the frustrations that are on our students for many reasons. Uh, uh, of course, I'm here as a researcher in academic integrity there, or perhaps better way to phrase this sometimes is in the, uh, the breaches of academic miscon uh, academic integrity, essentially academic misconduct there, because essentially I could talk to everyone about how to act ethically and uh, honestly, I could have that conversation with students. It would bore the pants off them because it is just something that people don't care about. They care about cheating there. So I've spent most of my career from my PhD finished back in 2003, looking at areas to do with plagiarism, contract cheating, which I'll come to in a bit, uh, and other forms of misconduct, as well as solutions for that. And I don't think this is very much a um, social media type conference, but if you are tweeting, feel free to tag me in at, at Dr. Lancaster for that one. So I've picked up on four main areas to greater and lesser extents that I want to touch upon during this keynote. Very much what I've just talked about, the threats to academic integrity to set the scene for that. Uh, these, these are areas I've, I've conducted research into. It's not a research heavy presentation, as I said. I want to look a little bit about is detection the solution? Can we just try and find everyone who is cheating and stop it? Because we had mentioned this in the previous talk about collusion, which is always has been a problem, always will be a problem. Is it a solution about technology? I'm in a computer science department. My colleagues will say, yes, it is. I have a slightly uh, more balanced viewpoint on this one. So I may something, say something different. Uh, now, we're leading into a whole session and a whole day or half day about assessment. So very much look at assessment design. Is that a solution? And then something I'm really keen to do, and it came across, I was so pleased to see in the talks yesterday where we had student partners involved with collecting data, developing research, uh, developing new, um, 
working out what to teach in courses, partnership working with students. To me, it's probably one of the most important things we can do to improve our education as a whole. So let's start off a bit by thinking about what kind of threads are out there. And I could be quite clear, I could just do a whole session talking about threads. Uh, in fact, some days I've pretty much done a whole day's workshop talking about threads and going through all the different opportunities that are out there for students who want to cheat the system. And this is nothing new. Here is an example that I found on Twitter, shared by Brian there, about uh, a pair of a pair of socks, cheating socks, where people could write notes for taking their imperial, their imperial, not related to where I work, imperial civil service examinations, way back 1644 to 1911. And there are other pictures along with that one, the books, the, the vest that can be used concealing notes to get an advantage in an examination situation is absolutely nothing new. In fact, I could go and talk about how much easier it is now in many cases for things like mini hidden earpieces. You can have out inside your ear, completely out of sight to let somebody uh, outside the exam room communicate with you. Unless you're in vigilating an exam and you move everyone's hair back and you peer into their ear to see what's going on. So there will always be ways to get materials into examination settings there. And there is sometimes a certain contest that goes on, and I don't want to think it of um, students versus academics, but people who just want to know if they can cheat the system. It's the same mentality, which is the hacker mentality for anyone who remembers the days of people trying to hack into government websites there. People want to know, can they get one over on the system? Uh, can they, unfortunately, in some cases, the modern university setting, can they hack into the systems and change their marks? That definitely happens if there are security flaws with things we do. So I've spent most of the 15 years or so, slightly more than that, focused on the problem of contract cheating. Essentially, a student getting someone else to do their work for them. Most commonly with money changing hands, but not always. It can be a friend, it can be a family member. All these people have a vested interest in helping the student to succeed because let's face it, you're somebody's uh, family member, then you, you want them to get the degree. You're investing your time and your money, your reputation into the students there. And you can just go ahead, you can do a search online very easily for something so innocent as help with my biology essay and you get adverts back like the one at the top quite often personalized not perhaps quite so strongly personalized in uh, bioscience as in some other fields but um, they very much exist out there and this is essay of course essay is not the only type of assignment that is out there you want some presentation slides producing for you that's available you want a script that's available you want a literature view, that is available there. So things can very easily be purchased. Second example from a, a micro outsourcing site called Fiverr, somebody who is very specifically advertising in that domain. But there are very qualified people out there who don't have jobs or perhaps their job is, uh, they consider their job is working as a ghostwriter. They have got the skills because they've gone through degrees themselves. They may work in a country or live in a country outside the UK. So and the money a student pays them may or may not seem like a huge amount of money to the student, but it seems like a good amount for the standard of living in the country they're in. Now, uh, something that came up very clearly in the keynote yesterday was, of course, the cost of living crisis. And something that comes through in research into this field are uh, that it can be cost effective for a student to go and work at a part-time job and to pay for the assignment as opposed to learning the material, putting all that time and effort in and doing it for themselves there. Sometimes people feel forced to go down that route. 
just because of all the other pressures that are on them. Pressure is a massive problem for our students. Now, I have just one more example of the other side of the coin. I've done a lot of work as well looking at who the people are who are producing work for students. Interestingly enough, you drill down into that work primarily based in Kenya, single biggest place where the Kenyan government has tried to encourage people to take work from home jobs, even pre-pandemic there to get into the gig economy. But of course, that is, um, has pushed them to writing work online, of which so much writing work online is the massive industry of education. Uh, here's, here's an example that appeared um, very recently. And the thing that stood out to me about this one is, first of all, the fact this is being positioned as a tutor that somebody who you drill down into the detail of that, I've just picked out the fact that it happens to include subjects that are relevant to this particular group of people there. But the what we would call a, um, a contract cheating provider, a writer is being positioned in the job description as being a tutor, so it looks legitimate. It's being positioned quite often to the students that you are getting tutoring. The other word that appears a lot in advertising for services is support. We are here to support you. During the pandemic, there are all kinds of I think, saying things like, um, don't, um, don't suffer in private at home. We are your support service. They're very much making out that you can go online, you get the support that isn't available so directly through your university. And something to take away from that is to think about what is the support? Do students know where to go for support? for academic skills, not just all the other skills. We know that students have um, challenges with their mental health there, but what do they do if it is 1 a.m. in the morning, their deadline is the next day, they're frustrated, they're stuck, they don't want to lose the night, and they, they look for help and an advert comes up there. How do we make sure they don't go down the, the wrong path? What can we do to mitigate in that type of circumstance? I could talk for a long time on this. There. Right. Uh, challenges do not stand still. I've worked in technology. I've seen challenges change over the past 20 years. Collusion still exists there, hopefully accidentally. Plagiarism still exists. You can copy and paste from the internet. You will often find it gets flagged with similar text. But... What we're starting to see emerging is really the trend of the last six months or so that perhaps not everyone has come across yet have been the things like sites that will generate your essay for you using the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning there. Now, I, I, I want to ask just alongside this that there have been some tests done with this and they've essentially shown you've got um, you'll get slightly worse marks than you would do if you went to the trouble of doing this yourself. There's a good chance you'll pass there, particularly if you're slightly smarter than just taking the auto-generated text and handing it in, and you know that you can go through and you can edit it, you can add better sources. And um, so, um, so you get imperfect text back at the moment, you get some quite good text. It's amazing how fast these models are coming along. Again, this is uh, the sad side of my computer science side of things, but I, I am there with colleagues who are very much working in the AI field who are trying to improve the technology for writing for us. But of course, from an educational standpoint and wanting to assess the students' own work, then um, uh, we, we're stuck at the other side of things for that one. So there's plenty of these services. Students who know what to do with them can use them quite powerfully. They get a lot of things done. And I would say within one year, the standard of work will be, I'd say, very close to human level. That's how fast technology is changing and improving there. I'll give you some ideas about things we can do to get around that later on in the session. Uh, Here's a, just one of the few research papers I'm mentioning, paper I published with my undergraduate student, Codrin, during the pandemic, uh, suddenly became, I think, one of my most cited papers of all time, 
But this involves the use of an online site called Chegg that some of you may have come across during the pandemic. And uh, the, essentially what is behind this paper is showing that the number of requests be it by students for answers to um, what may be homework questions had gone up by about 200% year on year before and after the pandemic. So the students were posting questions on the site to get answers back, slightly different model to traditional contract cheating because once an answer is up there, uh, multiple subscribers can access this answer. But what kind of trends did we see during that time? We would see a question appearing. We would see things that look like numbers of marks associated with the question. Uh, and of course, we would see answers to that question arriving within 30 minutes because that is what a student is, is wanting when they subscribe to this kind of service. Now, uh, we may have different views about this one, but to us, this appears that somebody could be sat at home taking an exam. They could be posting their questions up during the exam. They could be getting answers back before the end of that exam there. And so students know about these services. Uh, people often say, you talk about this in a, um, in a presentation, are you giving the game away to students? And I need to say students know that sites like this exist. And we are probably in a situation now with more face-to-face -face exams. Whether exams are the perfect type of assessment is an entirely different debate to be had, but students still know there are services out there. No. So let's just a few, sorry, nice, nice cheerful session, doom and gloom, as we heard in the previous talk. There, but I want to say we, we can do a certain amount of detection if we choose to do so. We also need to be sometimes quite strategic. Just as students are strategic in choosing which assignments to work on and where to put their effort in, we need to be quite strategic sometimes as staff as to what is the best use of our time to make sure that all our students are still supported. And one very simple thing that we can do is we can look for misconduct. When a student hands in a piece of work there, uh, is anything amiss? We would have had this conversation a few years ago about looking for plagiarism. Uh, are there references to things the student has not been taught to non-local services? Is this written in American English instead of UK English? Assume it, you have to be slightly careful with that one, unfortunately, because a lot of international students now are, um, are taught in uh, international English there. Now, do the references make sense? One incidentally thing you'll find contract cheating firms, writers are paid by the word. They want to turn this out as quickly and superficially as possible a lot of the time there. If they can make up a reference or if they can make an outdated reference look current by changing the year, then some of them will do that. It's, um, it's to their advantage when your aim is to, uh, is to do two assignments a day to pay your bills for that one. So, so be a bit suspicious, trust the students, but if anything looks amiss, have a bit more thought about it or put it to one side for someone else to look at. Um, I could talk a lot, a lot about technical solutions. My PhD was on plagiarism detection. We have good tools now that do this written work for us. We have less good tools for more practical subjects, more graphical subjects, for more diagram type subjects, whatever it might be. But think about what is appropriate in your field. Again, people are working on this technology. It is improving. Uh, I have plans, for instance, to have my, some of my very good final year project students this coming year uh, look at how to detect AI generated text. There's not been a huge amount of work there. But I believe it is possible because I think there are certain ways that machines write, which are not always identical to how humans write. But think about what is appropriate. You will know specifics for your field better than me because every field is slightly different. And have some form of detection in place. Uh, in an example, it's the invigilator there. It is that visible deterrent. And even if we very much hope we will never catch a student cheating and none of our students will cheat, then just by having a deterrent will mean that people who are tempted will have to consider, is it worth it? Am I going to be caught there? So it's always worth telling the students, you do use Turnitin, 
or whatever the equivalent originality checking software is there. Uh, it is certainly is not perfect, but uh, students do not always know. It is again is that potential risk at that point. So let's think about what we can do in terms of improving our assessments. And we have lots of very good ideas coming up. That is the focus of uh, at least one of the parallel strands for the rest of today. But uh, doom and gloom again, if somebody wants to cheat, they will find a way for that one. Uh, people always ask me, what is the uncheatable assessment? Uh, and I would say the single hardest assessment to cheat is going to be you as a student in a room with three members of staff giving you a tough viber and adapting their questions based on everything you say. But I mean, even that, not completely impossible. Um, it'd probably be very difficult and very expensive, but there are ways that you can find out that information is being channeled to a student. Someone else can hear this conversation. Their uh, answer is coming in. There's this brief pause before a student provides their responses. It is possible. It, that would be incredibly rare. Uh, it would not be cost effective. I imagine in most cases you want to get a degree. There are easier ways to do it. <laughs> By the degree, you'll go to a different university that's not going to put you through all the hassle. So it is. Um, but... There's uh, an example in the International Journal of Education Integrity from, what is that, five years ago now. But I remember going to the conference presentation on this one and seeing the kind of prepared teeth that people taking dentistry exams were sneaking into the room to implant into, um, well, I guess a synthetic mouth. They were not putting it into <laughs> people's mouths there at that point. But they were marked up and people could always say one institution. It is always possible, even in a practical situation, much as I would like to say that practical uh, situations are good. Um, one thing to do when you set an assignment is think about, are the answers already out there? So, so I mentioned, for instance, Chegg, there's lots of certain services like that, Course Hero. There are literally tens of thousands of answers to questions built up on those sites because they're questions that students have submitted. There, there are even questions that have been licensed from textbooks, which they, they work with the textbook publishers there. There was a, um, quite a controversial um, activity, was it maybe a year or two ago, when authors were getting paid through their publisher to agree to license their textbook questions to check so the answers could be up ready for students to have. And there's that ethical question at that point, then do you license your questions knowing that some people who can pay can get the answers straight away there? And the amount of money being offered was quite minuscule, but I suppose the amount of money you get for writing a book is quite minuscule as well, as we, those of us who've done that know. So, yeah. Uh, but... If you just use, and I'm sure that he does the same questions year on year, there will be file archives. If you use uh, very similar questions to textbooks, there'll probably be answers out there that can be done with very, um, very easily. So see what is out there, it's worth doing that search. And you may be amazed that there are archives out there which are linked to university names, university departments with these things in. I'd like to think a bit as well about what skill are we aiming to assess as part of this process. And you've got something vaguely like a test tube and a pen on that slide for that one. But are we assessing a student's ability to conduct an experiment? Are we assessing a student's ability to write about an experiment? And these are not the same skill there. How far can you fake the writing process? How far can you get someone else to do it for you? Borrow a friend's and very slightly change the numbers in a way that still makes sense, or whatever it might be. All this about thinking about um, what works, because I know we still cover quite a wide range of different areas of expertise in this room for that one. So for my example, for instance, as a computing person, I want to see a student can program. I don't want to see the can write a report about how they develop their program. That is a very different skill. And 
Uh, just, just, just as a complete aside, I've always loved setting assignments about getting students to reflect on something, to show what they've learned for that one. But those are incredibly easy assignments a lot of the time to outsource. Because what you find comes through in so many of those assignments in an uncontrolled uh, fashion, uh, what would you do differently? What would you do differently as in, in your work? What has started earlier? Time management, that comes through so often. And I've seen fake examples of nursing reflections where we have completely made up anecdotes about patients and um, the support they have had there. Uh, and, and again, there are ways around that one, things like thinking about in what situation is the student right in their reflection? How much time have they got to go and do something different? But they're not always the easiest ones to get around. Uh, here is a, a version of a famous TV builder, hopefully far enough into parody that we are not quite into the breach of copyright there. But the question is, can we fake it? Which essentially goes back to what I said in the previous slide. Can you pretend you did this, but didn't? Uh, I mean, the example I always remember for this one, I'm an external examiner a few years ago, uh, looking at student project reports and finding a project report which had copies of survey results in the back. And the survey results showed the age group of the person putting it in, it showed their degree qualification and uh, this particular person had somehow contacted quite a few 17-year-olds with PhDs there. And somehow this had got through the markers because you, you can be a little bit immune to the fact that a student may try and pull the wool over your eyes if you've been working with them and supervising them. And I can understand that, wanting the best in all our students. But um, yeah, this is this example of our builder there is just something I generated with the systems out there for making AI art. And as you can see, made many more versions of that with a click of a button, because that is the, the standard now of artificial intelligence generated art with some free solutions available out there for, for people. And in fact, many of my pictures, if you think sometimes, Although the proportions were slightly off on that, then a lot of them were AI generated for this talk, just to give me a bit of variety from the usual depth art I use. But again, a big change, but you can see all kinds of technical diagrams um, generated now, and that technology is improving as well. Uh, uh, likewise, you, you may notice this person will fall off because this is, um, this is an approximation of what scaffolding would look like. But... This idea, and it came through very clearly from Michelle yesterday, very important to me as well, about transitioning. How do you make sure students are prepared for university? They have the right background, they have the skills, how they have the continual induction throughout their time. You can't take everything in with uh, intense lectures during week one, which tell you about every support service in the university that you then never revisit after that point. Yeah. And do the students really have these skills? I know so many people who assume that because a student arrives that um, uh, someone else has taught them how to write a reference, just to give you an academic integrity type example, but actually nobody has there, or they think it only works in one place. Um, uh, or has anyone taught them how to write? This came through very strongly a few years ago when I was in Southeast Europe doing research in this field, but actually, Nobody had ever taught students academic writing and given them that support because it is not an easy skill to write well. Let's face it, we've, we've, all, we've all done it. Um, I benefited a lot during my PhD from people going through and making changes and crossing out lots of extra words and um, red, red ink everywhere in that. Uh, hopefully now it's using a slightly uh, less controversial color. But what is support going along along the way? And how do we help people in financial difficulties? How do we help them with the environment? I'm just reminded I spent the night yesterday in a wonderful halls of residence along with many of you. And I enjoyed the night of every single door slamming shut because it was the only way to get in and out of the building. And when you're in that environment, it is very hard to learn. So what is going on with our students more widely? And, um, and why they don't put shelves in a bathroom, I will never know that. Right. Yeah. What assessment can we use? 
students get bored doing the same assessment over and over again, just like I would get bored if I didn't change my talks around every single time I, I, I use them. But what assessment we use to engage students? I've got sort of an example. So I know podcasting is coming up later, a great skill for students to have something a bit different. But now clearly you could get somebody to script your podcast for you. But there are ways to make interesting podcasts there. Uh, and to me, you get students engaged in an assignment, they're less likely to want to outsource it. They're going to feel if they understand why they're doing the assignment, it's valuable to them, of course, for that one. But I just want to also go back slightly to the, the previous slide as well and mention that we're going to get students to do a podcast, or in my case, is last few years, we've done lots of videos in the absence of live presentations. Do students actually know how to create a podcast? Do we actually know how to edit a video together? Those are skills in their own right. And um, in, in my days when I was much more in charge of recruitment for a, for a faculty, uh, we used to have journalism students. They used to spend a whole course learning how to edit podcasts together and to do broadcast journalism and radio programs. And we're sort of cramming this in as something, a skill you have to have before you even start an assignment. So what is the support there to help students along the way? Uh, uh, just just an, old, an old technique, which is um, local knowledge. We, are we asking students something they have to physically have attended or um, they have to know our local uh, institution, they have to know what's going on to complete the assignment, they have to have the expertise, they're going to develop in class, or is it something generic that anyone around the world could do? without that, bearing in mind that a student can outsource their work and they can give the, the worker access to the BLE or to the course materials. So again, none of these are simple solutions there. Uh, this is not a real student in case you wondered. I think I've been subliminally um, influenced in my choice of tie today as well by this picture, but, which is yellow for people on Zoom who can't see me for that one. How do we prepare students for the commercial world? I, I put this up because I wanted to check what was being taught across your discipline and looked at lots of university marketing materials. And there was so much, as, as it should be, about employability, about business acronym, uh, about commercial awareness there. And how are we doing this? How are we giving them this, the real world skills, which again, they feel can go on their CV and can be... Um, but, well, we want students to have a wide range of skills to get employment at the end. So just to, just to close, a few ideas then about keeping our assignment um, or our work relevant. Do you know what is going on in your students' lives? Do you know what they're thinking? Do you know what they're learning? Do you know what's changed and how they're taught at school compared to uh, how they are now? Uh, or because you, when you're at school for that one. I've got a little bit to the, the scaffolding. Of course, students in the past few years had a very different experience. And one thing that I'm still struggling with is how we make sure students are ready to take exams this coming year when chances are they have not done any exams through the past few years. And this whole idea of being stuck in an exam hall, very time limited, quite tough exams in my institution, because that is still the style of assessment in many cases there. Um, what do we do to support that? So, but what do we know about our own students? Because every discipline is different, every university is different. And that's why when we, we saw for instance, survey results yesterday, you get slightly different results institution to institution, because that is how it is. They have different backgrounds there. There is, of course, the idea that um, we want you to be ethical in the workplace. We're not teaching you to become a banker or a politician. There. Um, how do we do that? Why is teaching you about these skills important? Why is referencing actually important and uh, giving credit for that one? There. Uh, is it something that comes through the code of practice of your professional bodies, which I'm sure it does, it does in the computing professional bodies for that one, even though I have since found out that. Um, I don't know any um, any employers actually ask students about this at interviews, but it's still incredibly important there. How will you act with integrity? What happens if you don't learn the materials now? What happens if you take a shortcut in the first year of your degree? What do you do then when you go into the second year, you go into the third year, 
and the firms are then they have your contact details they're bombarding you with offers to try and get you to use their services for that one um, i do a lot of work with student co-partners and um i do a lot of research with them so a few examples crack up chloe and um Rahul on the slide there of things I've been involved with. Uh, I have a, an academic integrity research module, which is offered across the whole of Imperial as one of the, the iExplore options. A lot of us, I'm sure, have a similar scheme. We can take modules across the whole site, but trying to give students a different introduction rather than just doing a continued module about how to avoid plagiarism, as important as that may or may not be. But what can we do to make use of our students? Because our students understand this field quite often so much more than we do. Ultimately, this is going to come down to a decision for students. It's the risk versus the reward. Uh, what is the risk if you breach academic integrity? What is the risk if you take notes into an exam? You plagiarize. What is the reward if you get away with it? And quite often our systems can be... Uh, quite draconian in many cases. You you don't hand in your work in time. We have no flexibility there. You get a mark of zero. You fail the year. But, uh, that is incredibly expensive. That is the cost of an additional year fees, home fees or international fees. Uh, it is the cost of an additional year of accommodation, living costs. It is being out of graduate level employment for an additional year. Huge opportunity costs there for a student. What is the risk? You attempt to get a mark you don't deserve. You've heard some other people have got away with it. There, uh, chances are you won't get caught. Chances are if you do get caught, then you'll just be given a warning and you may even end up in a better situation by getting caught than you would be by just not handing in that work at all or seeking help. So there is this dilemma of risk versus reward that a lot of the time, the student's perception of this, whether true or not, is that the reward is the correct answer there. Um, I've, I've deliberately not mentioned the word authentic throughout this talk, but essentially what so many of the solutions boil down to is authentic assessment. Uh, there's, there's a debate in the academic integrity field about what authentic assessment means and whether some areas of authentic assessment can still be, um, be breached, which of course they can, but real world tasks, industry simulations, whatever is relevant to your area, dealing with real external companies and examples, so incredibly important for the student to feel engaged, for them to want to complete the work um, and all the advantages that come with it. And again, we, I think it, I everyone in here like me is in the situation where it's not just a, a subject where you write about it. We're not teaching some of the humanities areas where this can end up happening so much more there. So people do have to go in a lab. And there is only so far you can fake your ability in a lab for that one. But varying the assessment, getting people to feel developing skill, telling them why they do assessment is so important to helping to ensure our students are, um, are happy, they're fulfilled at university, they're understanding their needs, and ultimately that um, we're doing what we we all want, what I certainly want is the students to be successful in their education, their career, and in their life. So thank you. Hey, thank you very much. That was, that was brilliant. I like the positive ending. <laughs> so we've had lots of questions on Padlet. So I'm going to ask three. And if I don't um, read out your question, then maybe you can grab it from us over a coffee. Okay. So this is the one with the most upvotes. So um, what do you feel is the threat of AI in the future for contract cheating in different types of assessments? Maybe not essays, but other assessment modes, interpretive data analysis, that type of thing. Uh, yeah, great question. So. Uh, I don't know if Zoom will have picked that up or not, but where do I see the threat of artificial intelligence in the future for different subject areas? Now, uh, a little little plug, then on Friday, I'm doing a webinar for the European Network for Academic Integrity, looking at artificial intelligence and the associated threats. Friday at 12 noon UK time. So it's uh, the link is pinned, I think, on my, my tweets. So have a look there if you're particularly interested in more about this field. I have sadly got several examples of where I can use AI to get assignments done to share in that one. But 
Um, writing is coming along very fast. Art is coming along very fast, as you saw there. I mean, I have generated several thousand images of my art. Uh, now, is that art? Is that my art? That is a, a question that is one of the ethical ones that we can ponder at that one. There are systems out there to automate the production of literature reviews, to go through particularly abstracts, to gather relevant data, to gather comparative numbers, tabulate them, and to improve a lot of that process. Clearly intended to be useful for researchers when you're writing academic papers, but obviously they can be misused. Uh, I get e regular emails from one of the companies behind that about all the improvements they're making to their software all the time for that one. Uh, in terms of automating data analysis, well, I mean, really, that's, that's already happening. That's what machine learning is, dealing with large amounts of data and numbers and trying to draw conclusions from it. So I can see these systems becoming, again, incredibly powerful for doing that. And um, I mean, let's, let's face it, how many people who have read an academic paper where essentially somebody has done a survey, they've collected lots of numbers, and they've just gone through SPSS and automatically run every single possible test and comparison of the variables to see what correlates to then form the basis of a paper, regardless if it makes any sense or not for that one. I've certainly reviewed plenty of those papers, so they definitely exist out there. So yeah, so so data, big threat. And, and the other area, of course, is computing is automatically writing computer programs. Again, that is coming along very fast. You say what you want the computer program to do, to a certain extent, the machine can generate the code. Um, okay, and the next question is about metadata. So is use of metadata reliable to investigate the work process of students or are they now too wise for that? Uh, yeah, great question. I, uh, I, I guess preclude this by saying, so the question is, can we use the metadata to investigate the, the work of students? In other words, presumably to check, is it their own? So if you open up, say, a Word file and look at the properties, then you would see things like the creation time, the person who wrote this, how long has it been edited for? And if you look at that kind of number and you see, oh, the editing time is 30 seconds. That's a little bit odd because that's quite fast. So there are things that stand out. Also, if you see someone else's name other than the student, again, that can be a bit suspicious. Now, you, it's, it's always worth looking at this information if you're concerned that it may not be by the student. Uh, the student may have a reason for it. They may, now, I, I use my friend's computer. Whether true or not, that is a reason that can be given for that one. Uh, I don't think in general most students are that aware about how much of a, a digital footprint they leave behind. Uh, perhaps computing students, but, uh, students, but we have students whose use of technology is very good, but the use of technology is about using TikTok or Snapchat. That is not quite the same as being proficient with the inner workings of computer systems. So there's definitely data there. But if I was to tell you how to detect contract cheating, and there is a great checklist, incidentally, by the London and Southeast England Academic Integrity Network, which you can find for contract cheating, which is the group that I manage for people in that area interested in that, um, then it, essentially it says, look for clues. You want more than one clue about why something is not by the student. We don't want to falsely accuse students because it is, it is incredibly stressful for a student who is put through an academic misconduct process there. And I'm still so mindful of uh, wanting to balance ensuring academic integrity with supporting students with their mental health and supporting them to succeed. That's brilliant. Um, and then the last one and I'll read out is how well do you think the education of the students through tutorials around research and scientific integrity can be used to address cheating or bad practice before it happens? Yeah, so how well can, um, so, so teaching tutorials for students about research methods and integrity, and can that help to prevent cheating? Well, I mean, it's certainly, it, it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. We, we need to do this. We can't assume students come in with this knowledge. We need to tailor these examples to different disciplines as well. So why is ethics and integrity important in our discipline? For that one. And uh, I mean, I could go, for instance, a computer computing student. And how would you feel if you were developing um, the, the resources for a game and somebody stole those resources? Happens in the real world, something that may maybe tailor it more towards them for that one. 
but think about what's relevant in your discipline. So there are, there are parts of the understanding about ethics and integrity, why it's important, the understanding how to get help there, uh, but also the, the foundational skills, which are there, how do you write? How do you write a lab report, if that is the core skill for that one? How do you conduct, um, uh, how, how do you reference? That's the one that comes across everywhere. Why is referencing important? There's all kinds of examples. But you can be a bit more creative. You can have discussions in class. You can do things like show students. Here is an example of an essay writing service. What do you think about their offer? And have that discussion. Look at the claims on the page there. One of the claims they will make is you are getting 100% plays and free work. What does that mean? Because of course it is original work. If you, it may or may not be original work there. Is it plagiarism free? Well, of course not, because by the, the very nature, when you hand it in, that is a form of plagiarism because it's not your work there. So you can do a lot more bringing in external um, sources that are relevant to your discipline. That's why it's so important as well to have a lot of these discussions at discipline level, which um, I can give a broad overview. Very, very good examples in some fields, but not every, every single field. Okay. Well, thank you very much.